Please join me in a spirit of prayer and meditation. After our spoken prayer and a time of silence, we will sing together Spirit of Life, hymn number 123, which is also printed in your order of service. We'll sing it first in English and then in Spanish. Our prayer this morning is by Stephen Schick. Spirit of life, God of love, grant me the courage to love boldly in the face of my greatest fears. Grow me in your wisdom and let my actions speak when silence threatens justice and indifference disturbs peace. When gossip, hate, and cruelty arise among friends or in public places, help me bravely walk forward with love. When I defensively assert certainty in the presence of the unknown, grant me the courage to live comfortably in the unanswerable questions of life. Bless me with the eternal gift of not knowing and let it take root in me until it pushes forth shoots of understanding and branches of humility. Amen. Speaking of wisdom, so I have two wisdom readings for you. And they both happen to come from the back of the hymnal, so if you're one of those people that likes to follow along, the first one is number 469. The Wisdom of Solomon. I am mortal, like everyone else, a descendant of the first formed child of earth, and in the womb of a mother I was molded into flesh within a period of ten months. When I was born, I began to breathe the common air and fell upon the kindred earth. My first sound was a cry, as is true of all. I was nursed with care and swaddling clothes. No king has had a different beginning of existence. There is for all one entrance and one way out. Therefore I prayed and the spirit of wisdom came to me. Our second reading is number 484 by William Henry Channing. To live content with small means, to seek elegance rather than luxury, and refinement rather than fashion, to be worthy, not respectable, and wealthy, not rich, to study hard, think quietly, talk gently, act frankly, to listen to stars and birds, to babes and sages with open heart, to bear all cheerfully, do all bravely, await occasions, never hurry, to let the spiritual, unbidden and unconscious grow up through the common. This is to be my symphony. At the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly last month, Krista Tippett was invited to give the WHERE lecture to thousands of gathered UUs from all over the country. Since 1922, the Unitarian Universalist Association has invited notable people to share their insights through this important annual lecture. Previous speakers include Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Saul Olinsky, and Kurt Vonnegut. Krista Tippett is a broadcaster, podcaster, and author. You might be familiar with her radio program, On Being. It used to be called Speaking of Faith. It's one of my favorite radio shows. I love the questions Krista asks her guests. They discuss so many aspects of life in a very thoughtful way. 
I also just read her latest book, Becoming Wise, an inquiry into the mystery and art of living. And so this morning I want to share some of her insights from the book and from her Ware lecture. Krista starts by setting the scene for us. Where are we in the larger scheme of things? Where are we in this grand history of the human story? We are turn of century people, she says, and this terrifying and wondrous century is throwing open basic questions the 20th century thought it had answered. Questions that are intimate and civilizational all at once. Definitions of when life begins and when death happens. Of the composition of marriage and family. Of the meaning of gender. Of identity itself. Of human relationship to the natural world. Of human relationship to technology and through technology. We are reimagining the very nature of authority, of leadership, of community, of tribe. Fundamentally reconsidering how we structure our lives together. We are in the midst, Krista says, of nothing less than a reformation. But this time, it's a reformation of all of our institutions, not just the church. The challenge for us, though, she says, is that we are in an interesting moment where we know the old ways aren't working anymore, but we cannot yet see what the new forms will be. Religions came into being in just such a time. During the Axial Age, a handful of centuries before the Common Era, Confucius was born in China. The Buddha saw enlightenment. Plato and Aristotle examined life and mind and soul. And the Hebrew prophets began to pen a people of God into being. It was then that humanity began to give voice to the questions that have animated religion and philosophy ever since. What does it mean to be human? What matters in life? What matters in death? How can we be of service? When the philosophers and thinkers of that time, though, were answering these questions, they were not on Facebook. They did not craft scripture 144 characters at a time. They were not connected instantly through the World Wide Web to people in every far-flung corner of the globe. So when we ask these big questions, what matters in life? How can we be of service? What does it mean to be human? we might be coming up with some pretty different answers. With a 24-hour news cycle, with the technology to eviscerate entire cities at the stroke of a button, with scientific proof of how we are destroying the earth, with the ability to travel to all parts of the globe, or to order everything we need to live on from Amazon.com and never leave our air-conditioned houses, it's a little scary to think about what answers we might come up with about being human. But Krista doesn't seem to despair. Instead, she seems a little excited. We all have it in us, she says, to be nourishers of discernment, fermenters of healing in this moment. We have it in us to create the spaces for taking up the hard questions of meaning in our time with different others to discover how to calm fear and plant the seeds of robust common life. This is civic work and it is human spiritual work. 
In Becoming Wise, Krista offers some reminders to us about how to best channel wisdom as we strive to answer the big questions of our age. The first is to remember that words matter. The words we use, she says, shape how we understand ourselves, how we interpret the world, how we treat others. And the world right now needs the most vivid, transformative universe of words that you and I can draw on and give voice to. Some words, which we think of as positive words, are simply not good enough at this turning point in history. Take the word tolerance, for example. Tolerance is a good thing, isn't it? And in the 20th century, tolerance was something to strive for. But the other day, my sister gave me this t-shirt. And it says, tolerate on it. And I don't know if you can see it, but the word tolerate is crossed out. And above it is written the word celebrate. It's really not enough to just tolerate each other and our differences anymore. We need to celebrate them. Tolerance, Krista says, connotes allowing, enduring, and indulging. It means we'll put up with each other if we have to, but it doesn't say that we'll engage each other, learn about each other, strive to understand each other. Tolerance doesn't make us curious or open or moved. We are never transformed by tolerance. We are transformed, though, by hearing each other's stories. And that is Krista's next reminder to us, to practice the art of listening and asking questions. Words matter, but the other person's words matter, too. We spend an awful lot of time, don't we, in our public and in our private lives trying to figure out how we can best convey our beliefs, our point of view, our convictions. And when faced with differences, we feel challenged to express ourselves in a way that others can most understand. We think that if we could just use the right words, be articulate enough, just reach the right volume, we could really connect across difference by convincing everyone that we are right and that they should think exactly like us. We do it all the time. We do it at home, in our arguments with partners and spouses. We do it in our workplaces, at church and community meetings. And we for sure do it on a national scale when we attempt to talk politics. We see the value of expressing ourselves in the most knowledgeable way, but we don't always see the value of listening or of asking questions. So we continue to build up barriers between ourselves and others. The bricks in our walls are made of certitude, righteousness, and disdain for opinions other than ours. And we wonder why there are no bipartisan efforts happening, why things are not improving in our relationships. For a few generations now, Chris explains, we have all been trained to be advocates for what we care about. And this skill has an important place in civil society. But it can also get in the way of deciding to care about each other. Now listening is not being quiet while the other person speaks so that you can finally get around to saying what you have to say. In fact, it's not about being quiet at all. It's about being present. It's powered by curiosity. And that is a virtue that we can invite and nurture in ourselves and render it more instinctive. 
It involves a kind of chosen, self-imposed vulnerability, a willingness to be surprised, to let go of assumptions, and to take in ambiguity. The listener wants to understand the humanity behind the words of the other. This means that our questions can't be defensive or sarcastic or nitpicking. They need to be generous, honest, and expansive. They can't even be asked with the intention of achieving common ground. They must be asked without expectation, but with curiosity. And we have to listen, really listen, to the answers. When we value the conversation as much as we value winning someone over to our side, we are on the right track here. In an On Being interview that hasn't even aired yet, Krista Tippett spoke with Ruby Sales, one of the mothers of the civil rights movement. She talked about a question that she learned in those years of activism, which has never failed her in opening up encounters with someone who seems to be on the other side. And the question is just two words. What hurts? When asked about the current political climate, she asked another challenging question. She asked, behind the campaigns and the campaigners, how hard are you listening to the people in the crowd? And those are big crowds. How are you listening for the people in the crowd who don't really want or mean to be haters, but are begging to be asked, what hurts? I remember a conversation I had in college with my friend Chris. Chris is Catholic and we were in an argument because he had just told me that he would only date a Catholic girl. I thought that was terribly close-minded of him. I wasn't wise enough then to ask, what hurts? So we went around and around about it for a while until he said something that made a lot of sense to me. He said, you know what it is, Kate? I just don't want to go to church alone for the rest of my life. In Chris's mind, the girl he decided to date might be the girl he decided to marry. And if the girl he decided to marry wasn't Catholic, then he'd be heading to Mass on Sundays without her, and maybe without their kids if they had them. Chris had a deep faith life, but within that deep faith was a loneliness stemming from wanting to share it with someone else. And I totally got that. Suddenly, because I had actually listened to him, the other side became understandable to me. It didn't mean that we had to agree on things or think the same but it meant that we understood each other a little bit better. So words matter, listen, and Chris's last rung on the ladder to wisdom, love. What we practice, she says, we become. What's true of playing the piano or throwing a ball also holds for our capacity to move through the world mindlessly and destructively or generously and gracefully. It's time to practice love. Spiritual geniuses and saints have always called humanity to love, as have social reformers. When the civil rights leaders began their revolution in the 1960s, they did so in the name of love. There was an aspiration to create the beloved community. So how do we practice love? According to Krista, the mistake we've made as a society is that we've made love private, contained it in family, when really love's audacity is its potential to cross tribal lines. 
but we can use our knowledge about private love to teach us about public love. She reminds us that in our own closest, most intimate circles of family and friends and community, there are people with whom we are totally in sync. And there are probably more that drive us a little crazy. There are people that we can only stay in the room with by deciding that there are certain things we will just not talk about because we love them. And we are committed to staying in relationship with them. What if we could love more people like that? Not agree with them, but be committed to staying in the room with them because we love them. In an interview, legal and racial scholar John Powell says, people are looking for community right now, though we don't have confidence in love. We have much more confidence in anger and hate. We believe anger is powerful. We believe hate is powerful. And we believe love is wimpy. And so if we're engaged in the world, he says, we believe it's much better to sort of organize around anger and hate. And yet we see two of the most powerful expressions, certainly Gandhi, certainly Reverend Dr. King, and even though he came out of violent revolution, Nelson Mandela. John says, when I met him, he just exuded love. These leaders had real wisdom. These leaders knew about the importance of words and how to use them on behalf of their people. They knew about listening and they knew about love. What we need to learn in order to become wise is that we have those capacities also. I end with one of my favorite lines from the book. If we are stretching to live wiser, not just smarter, we will aspire to learn what love means, how it arises and deepens, how it withers and revives, what it looks like as a private good, but also a common good. May we go forth from here, strengthened for that journey toward wisdom, fed by the words we've heard, curious about each other and those we will encounter today, and willing, against all odds, to love. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.